Good evening, all. How is everyone this evening? It's always a, a rich treat, a true delight, and honor to be back here at Hope Reformed Baptist Church. It's a, it's a unique experience because so much of what is in this building and the ministry that goes on here, the pastoral work, the proclamation of the gospel has been just the continuity of the work of grace that I've been privileged to kind of somewhat sit on the sidelines, somewhat participate, but in any way, shape, or form be involved in seeing God tremendously pioneer His work of redemption in the lives of people and radically transform a city, a state, a nation for the gospel and the glory of Christ. And you're part of that story at Hope Reform Baptist Church. Keith mentioned that, uh, yeah, I was there on day number one of Hope used to be called Hope Christian Church. We quickly had to modify that. People turning up thinking we were a Pentecostal church. So we thought, let's, uh, let's slam Reformed Baptist in the name. At least we're being a little upfront about who we are. Uh, my wife was there. She's sitting back here. I think our first service, we had six people at it. And it uh, felt like a revival. And it uh, turns out it was for us. We went on for six months with three people, my wife and I. And then some random kept turning up. Not always the same person. And, you know, the surprise on their face when they would soon realize they're the only person there. You imagine what it would be like to visit a church for the first time, to walk in, and uh, you're there before start time, right? There's a couple people there. You think, I guess it's a small operation. You don't think too much. And then uh, you see the young lady get up, and she leads worship. You think, oh, that's nice. And the other guy gets up and preaches, and you realize, I'm the only attendee today. This is literally... And that was, uh, that was the hope story for, for months. I'm not going to regale you as the years of faithful service and labor. But this is, I used, when we first moved into this building, our first evening service here back in 2016, uh, we were jam-packed. We'd already outgrown it substantially. But I used to always call it, particularly to like an intimate in crowd, I used to call it the house that the gospel built. The house that the gospel built. And, and, and today to see the continuity of that labor and that service among the faithful elders here that continue to serve, Pastor Tom and the other assistants that preach and proclaim and evangelize and pastorally care for the people. It's a tremendous privilege to be welcomed back and to stand here before you all and just give thanks to God on behalf of the wonderful work of redemption that he's doing. Now, my primary Burden this evening is to turn to the book of Judges with you, Judges chapter 9. So grab a Bible, let's do that. We're going to dive into the Word of God together, Judges chapter 9. Now, before we do that, giving something of an overall summary of Judges 9, I'm just going to read the final few verses of chapter 8, as this is, this is a, a culmination of a narrative. And chapter 9 picks up the narrative very cleanly and neatly at the end of the life of Gideon, which Pastor Tom did a great job last Sunday night, I watched the sermon online, of just giving you the, the fullness and the sense of how God used Gideon and also the failures of the man Gideon. So as you're sitting there with Judges 9, I'm going to read the final verses of Judges 8, 29 to 35. Now we know that, that Gideon gets a new name, Jerubael. We'll call him Gideon as often as we can just for the sake of, of recognition. So Judges 8.29, Jerubael, which is Gideon, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Now Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son. And he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, at Ophrah of the Abazar, as Abazrites. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Berith their God. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side, and they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubael, that is Gideon, in return for all that he had done to Israel. Before we dive into chapter 9 together and unearth all of the gospel good in that wonderful chapter, devastatingly depressing, yet wonderfully gospel chapter, we need to reflect upon these final summation verses of Gideon's life. When you read that, as I've just done, and you reflect upon what we've just discovered, the only person that wins out of all of that is Gideon. In a sense, Gideon's living his best life. 
He has dozens and dozens of sons. Who knows how many daughters are intermixed in that? He's got a, a seemingly many wives. We don't know how many, maybe dozens. He's, he's living a life of ill repute. Despite the anointing and the calling of God on his life, Gideon ends up at the back end of his existence serving self flattering self, indulging the lusts and the passions of the flesh. The reason why that's important is because chapter 9 is the cautionary tale. It's tagged onto the back of, of course, chapter 8, right? You don't need to come to the Haddon Institute to know that 9 comes after 8. I recommend Haddon Institute, right? But uh, most of you can do that math at least as simply. And you can realize that as the, as the narrator is giving us the consequences of chapter 9, you're, you're supposed to recognize that this is what it looks like when you act like Gideon. This is the result. This is the grim, ghastly consequences The only good news in these foreboding verses that we've just read is Gideon gets to live his best existence. And in living his best life, Gideon seems tragically unaware that as he does this type of living, as he he lives this form of existence, he does that at the expense of his sons and the nation as a whole. Before we dive in, as I said, to chapter 9, we're going to summarize the story in just a moment. I want to reflect at this early juncture of our discussion tonight, and I want to bring home with as much force as I'm capable of this simple consequential reality. Sin begets sin. And the sins of fathers and leaders and those in positions of power and authority, accountability and responsibility will always manifest themselves in those that come thereafter. Those of us in the room that are fathers, we we have children. We have to realize that as you lead as a father, which is what Gideon proved himself inept and incapable of doing, the greater the scope of your influence, the further your sin will bleed and breed and its deadly effects will permeate. For a king, for a monarch, for for a ruler, the sin of the people established sin for rulers and sin for rulers increase the sinfulness of the people and a vicious cycle exponentially increases. The chapter 8 is all about the heroism of Gideon and the finality of his end in self-indulgence and chapter 9 gives you the regaling of all of the horrific consequences. Let's take a look, as I've promised a number of times, at chapter 9. The first thing we're introduced to in chapter 9 is this region, city called Shechem. It's a long storied city in a region. And it's a region of curious history. It's It's not taken over by Israel. It's populated by Canaanites. And we don't know why. The Bible doesn't really tell us. There's not really an account so much as to, as to how or why there's theories that have been expounded and offered. But we don't know why Shechem was left pretty well, left to its own. And Israel, in its conquest, did not vanquish it, take the land, take the resources, enslave or kill the people, which was the predominant story of the conquest of Canaan. Why? We don't really know. But it's problematic because Gideon, in all of his collecting of women to have his way with them, he finds a a woman of ill repute from Shechem, presumably a Canaanite, and has a child, a son, by her. And that son's name is Abimelech. So we're introduced in chapter 9 to Abimelech. The chapter starts out, the son of Gideon. He's seeking to establish himself as the ruler. He goes to Shechem to persuade his mother, his mother's people, their family, and the leaders of Shechem to support him in becoming the tribal king. He's the only Shechemite of all of Gideon's sons. You see, Gideon, for the most part, had had fairly decent, at least social sense as to what what, what a wife should be, and yet Gideon also indulged in sleeping with harlots and prostitutes, even if they were Canaanite, and Abimelech is the product of one such liaison. And now Gideon's gone, he's died, and there's a power vacuum... We see this so often in history. Great men of great leadership ability, of great rule and authority, do not properly appoint an heir. And in the vacuum of their passing, there is grave disputes. 
Abimelech goes to his people in Shechem and says, do you guys want another Israelite to rule over you? I'm only half Israelite, so you might as well appoint me. They agree to it. They fund his little pernicious campaign. He gets all the other sons of Gideon, and he has them executed in genocide. He sets up this big stone. He says, line up the sons. And as they come, bam, they are sliced, cut, heads hacked off. They are killed in one bloodthirsty, outrageous display of Abimelech's pernicious nature. So Abimelech rises up. There is one brother, there is one son of Gideon that isn't killed. He, he finds out. He suddenly gets some intel. Maybe he was at the back of the line. We don't know. And he races off and he manages an escape. That's going to feature prominently in just a moment. So he murders his brothers to secure his rule. With the money procured from the Shechemites and a mob that he rabbles together, he arranges the murder of all of his brothers, 70 half-brothers. The sons of Gideon, except for the youngest, whose name is Jotham. So Jotham sees this plays out and presumably... Jotham is, of course, old enough to get a sense of awareness as to what's happening. And Jotham brings something of a prophecy against Abimelech. So if you've got Judges 9 there, we're going to take a look at verse 7 to 21. Jotham's going to give quite quite a nebulous, quite a challenging and somewhat convoluted prophecy about what will be the end result of Abimelech and the Shechemites who have co-conspired together for the murder of Gideon's sons and the establishment of this ungodly reign. Let's take a look at the text of Scripture. Verse 7. When it was told to Jotham, he went and stood on top of, on top of Mount Gerizim and cried aloud and said to them, Listen to me, you leaders of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The tree once went out to anoint a king over them. The trees once went out to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, shall I leave my abundance by which gods and men are honored and go hold sway over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, you come reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and go hold sway over the trees? And the tree said to the vine, You come, reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I leave my wine that cheers God and men and go hold sway over the trees? Then all the trees said to the bramble. Right, read read bramble as in a bit of drifting tumbleweed, right? Don't, don't think anything of substance, nothing of structural integrity whatsoever, a bramble. They go to the bramble. They say, you come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, if in good faith you are anointing me king over you, then come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now therefore, Jotham says, if you've acted in good faith and integrity when you made Abimelech king, and if you've dealt with Jeroboam and his house and have done to him as his deeds deserve, that's Gideon, remember, for my father fought for you, risked his life and delivered you from the hand of Midian, and you've risen up against my father's house this day and have killed his sons, 70 men on one stone and have made Abimelech, the son of his female servant, king over the leaders of Shechem because he is your relative. If you then have acted, verse 19, if you then have acted in good faith and integrity with Jerubbaal and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech. Let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo and let fire come out from the leaders of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and lived there because of Abimelech, his brother. And this is a shocking prophecy because so many of the constituent components of this prophecy will manufacture themselves in the story of Abimelech and his, his constantly fraught with tension relationship to Shechem. He had three years of rule. That's it. A very short run, an extremely short reign. And in those three years, they were permanently fraught with friction, with consternation, with infighting. One commentator wrote at this juncture and said, self-seeking opportunists 
And those capable of treacherous murder never make easy companions. Surprise, surprise. And it was not long before a breach occurred between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. For three years, he ruled, and it was the most, if you can believe it, it was the most, three of the most unpleasant years in all of the history of Israel. This unholy alliance, that, this, this covenant, this agreement that had been enacted on behalf of the Shechemites, Canaanites, and Abimelech, the half-Canaanite, in order to destroy all of Gideon's sons, ruin his legacy, murder all of his posterity, and take over Israel, had three years of the most fraught, disgusting, horrific rule. And I should tell you something. It should tell you something. When people are pining after authority and they'll do just about anything to achieve it, this, this, Machiavellian, this Machiavellian view of political power, that I just have to say the right thing at the right time, be the right person, chameleon type in every scenario, win the votes, get into power, rule and reign. That kind of person can never be trusted because you never know who they really are. Now, Bimelech shows us this. He proves this to be true. In the three years of his reign... He demonstrates that his reign is marked by treachery and violence. And there's a reciprocal resentment that breeds frustration. It invites insurrection and ends in genocide. The same commentator I quoted a minute ago helpfully clarifies. Because as you take a look at this particular verse here, it says, And Abimelech ruled over Israel for three years. It's a little bit of an overstatement in the English translation. In fact, the word doesn't really lend itself to rule. He's not really a king in any true, real sense. He's, he, he's more of a, of a lowly tribal, a tribal kind of, you know, tri- just chieftain somewhat. That he, he's really ruling by intimidation and, and by demonstrating how bloodthirsty he can be. This is primitive, it's barbarous, it's Neanderthalic, and it's the entirety of the three years of Abimelech's reign. And it ends in, as I said, it ends in genocide. There's a revolt against Abimelech. Surprise, surprise. The leaders of Shechem grow dissatisfied with Abimelech's rule. They conspire against him, and they gather the support of another actor who comes on the scene. We know nothing about him. His name's Gaul, son of Ebed, and he challenges Abimelech's authority. He challenges Abimelech's authority. And Abimelech raises up a bit of an army, and he goes to war. He battles, and he destroys Shechem after three years. Now, let let, let me make another comment, and I don't want anyone to go away from tonight thinking... The majority of what Craig spoke of was political commentary. That's not the essence of my point. But you must be sufficiently aware that those people with no love for those that they serve in political power do not care if they end up destroying the people they rule. They don't care. This could not be shown forth in any more of a graphic way than Abimelech, the battle, the destruction. Abimelech attacks Shechem. The very people that postured him in power. The very people that platformed him. He doesn't care. He demonstrates the malignity of his personality. And he turns on them. And in verse 39 to 40, and then 42 to 46, let me read this. It says, And Gaul went out at the head of the leaders of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him and he fled before him. And many fell wounded up to the entrance of the gate. On the following day, the people went out into the field and Abimelech was told, he took his people, verse 43, divided them into three companies, set an ambush in the fields, and he looked and saw the people coming out of the city, so he rose against them and killed them. Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward, stood at the entrance of the gate of the city, while the two companies rushed upon all that were in the field and killed them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He captures the city. He kills the people that were in the city. And he raised the city and he sowed it with salt. This relationship has reached a depth of depravity and bitterness unlike anything you see in contemporary accounts. He burns the city to the ground in an act of abject frustration and then he salts the entire earth so that for a century you couldn't grow a single crop or a garden bed. Such is his angst in three years. The bitterness that will rise up in Abimelech. He fought against the city. He raised the city, burnt it to the ground and sowed it. When all the leaders of the Tower of Shechem, apparently in Shechem there was this 
formidable structure, probably a stone structure, something of like a, like, like a fort, kind of, right? Think like a medieval car, castle, but more monolithic. And all the leaders, would, they would know. That was, that was kind of like a panic room, right? In a very wealthy, multi-millionaire's mansion, they'd have a panic room. And all the leaders of Shechem, they see Abimelech's just lost his mind. They all run for the tower. And they board up the windows and they board up the, the, the doors and they stay in the tower and they've got some food supplies and they think, we'll just wait him out. And you know what Abimelech does? Abimelech then invites all of his warriors that were with him to lean up against the tower bushes and limbs from trees and they burn the entire tower and kill everyone therein. Just destroys all of the leaders of the city in one fell swoop. In Judges 9.49 toward the end of the chapter, it says they set the stronghold on fire over them so that all the people in the tower of Shechem also died, a thousand men and women. At this point in the story, it looks, at least on the surface, like Abimelech would just get away with all this. It looks unhinged, completely out of control, completely unrestrained. There, there, there seems something about Abimelech that's, that's overtly demonic uh, as he goes on this, this killing rampage without any seemingly halt or hindrance. But the chapter ends with Abimelech's downfall. After the destruction of Shechem... Abimelech continues to pursue those who oppose him. This will always be the sign of someone whose mind has so broken with bitterness that he will pursue to the last breath those that they perceive are their enemies. Whether they are or aren't, there will be an, an obsession, a, a fixation, and Abimelech shows his own insecurities have now bubbled over into this frothing rampage. Now, during an assault on the city of Thebes, which apparently some of the Shechemites had found refuge in, they all went and hid in another tower. This was a common thing. Very few of the cities of Canaan had, had immense walled structures around the city, as we find in the book of, of Joshua, when they come to Jericho. Most of the cities were just open plan, thatched huts. They would normally construct in the center or near some populated, dense area, a large stone tower that they kind of had this, you know, there was a sign given and they'd all flee to it when there were marauders attacking. It's the same in Thebes. And all the leaders of Shechem, and they make an alliance with the people of Thebes. We don't know much about that city at all. It's a very small, seemingly inconsequential city. They all run into their tower. Well, They've heard the story before. Abimelech then gets his men and says, guys, this is, well, we've watched this movie before. We know, we, we know how this goes. This is just a rerun. Grab the brambles and the bushes and, and the tree limbs and, and grab the, the kindling and the tinder and bring it up against the tower. Let's burn it down and I'll finally be done with all my enemies. And as he begins to do that, he comes toward the tower and a woman leans out the window high in the tower with a millstone, like a millstone was a large grinding stone. That you would, you would create wheat. She leans out the window, drops the stone, plop on Abimelech's head, and he's lying with his head split open and still somewhat conscious. I read one commentator, who's unfortunately, his indulgence in comedy got the best of him. He said, a woman had a crush on him. <laughs> Abandoned his better judgment. And he's lying there, presumably, like I said, his skull cracked open, blood and brain, brain fluid going everywhere. And he turns to his arm bearer and says, I'm about to die. Right? Those moments of clarity when you're at your end. Says to his arm bearer, grab your sword, quickly stab me through. I don't want it known that a woman killed me. And his armor bearer obliges. But not even Abimelech, in his final moments of wickedness and idolatry, even gets his way. Still to this day, the story is known and recorded in holy, inerrant scripture that it was a brave woman leaning out a window, holding a millstone. She must have been a power lifter and a part-time, I don't know, drops this massive stone and destroys Abimelech. The story is done. A key text for this study tonight is verse 56 and 57, particularly verse 56. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech which he committed against his own father in killing his 70 brothers. 
God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads. And upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbaal. You get to the end of this chapter, and so often is the case when you're reading the book of Judges, you feel dissatisfied. You might even say to yourself, what is this doing in the Bible? What purpose does this chapter have? Why would we need to know these accounts? Terrific. It's ghastly. I've said many times before, if the Bible was pictured properly as a motion picture, it would be R-rated. Could you imagine this stuff being played out on screen? Here it is in the Bible. And I'm not ashamed of the gore or the ghastliness or the horrific nature of real human warfare. I'm not trying to say that we dodge that or we balk that or we're ashamed of it. But I'm saying it leaves the reader with a feeling of resentment and despondency. It induces a sickening feeling that such, such is the universal human experience. And let me say this. It is a wonder of wonders to dishonest conspirers when their co-conspirators conspire against them. Have you ever noticed that in life? Let me clarify what I mean by this. When someone conspires with you against someone else, in a dishonest way, what made you conclude that they were trustworthy people? I have to, I have to bear my own heart here tonight and say this. I, I've been in vocational ministry a long time. A long time. Not nearly as old as most as you think, but a long time. My daughter's friends come over the house. My daughter's 13. Her friends say, oh, you live with your grandparents. That's my lot in life. I tell people it's, it's miles on the clock. You do pastoral ministry for a long time, you get weathered. That's for sure. And yet at the same time, you think about this when I do marriage counseling and people come and sit before me, particularly people that are a little bit older, a little bit more seasoned, past midlife, past their prime, you might say. And you find out as the pastor that their relationship started on pretty rocky terms. They weren't actually each other's original spouse, put it that way. And, and, and you find out that now they're sitting before you, and their relationship started with, well, he's the boss of the company, and she's the, she's the secretary at the front desk, and they both married other people, but they, they fell in love, right? And now 20 years later, I'm their pastor, and they sit before me, and one of them is complaining about the unfaithfulness of the other. And I say, what made you think they were a trustworthy person? Do you remember when they gladly committed adultery with you? It is the wonder of wonders to untruthful, unfaithful, dishonest conspirators when their co-conspirators conspire against them. That is a bizarre impulse of human nature. There's no honor among thieves, as the old proverb goes. We see that fleshing itself out right here in this story. Shechem is shocked when Abimelech turns out to be a rotten, good-for-nothing, murderous tyrant. I wonder what gave it away, Shechem, right? And, and Abimelech is, sh I mean, he's gobsmacked. He, he's just floored by the fact that Shechem turns out to be an unruly mob of, un of lawless people. Well, I don't know, Abimelech. I wonder what gave it away. Do you guys remember how your relationship started with the murder of 70 of Gideon's sons? Do you guys remember how your relationship started by, by usurping authority that was not rightfully yours and now you're each shocked at each other's unfaithfulness? It's a bizarre component of the human experience. It's a story repeated time and again. It's as consistent as humans breathing, as humans being dishonest, as humans being shocked at the dishonesty of others. Is it not? It's funny how this works. And yet truth and time walk hand in hand. I want to bear witness tonight to you all. People will reveal themselves. They will show of what sort of nature they have if you give them enough time. A rotten and ghastly people sunk into the lowest of depravity. Just give them enough time and they will manifest their true nature. And yet as we look at this story, we come away from chapter 9. The Shechemites, almost entirely are dead. Abimelech's dead. Just about all of Gideon's sons are dead. 
and Jotham doesn't even seemingly rise to power. The whole story seems like it has, it has no actual upkick at the end, no positivity. It has nothing to confer upon you to induce any kind of hope whatsoever. Yet it's intriguing. As we meditate upon this, we think about the different components of this story. Firstly, the end deliverance by a woman. That's a strange artifact, is it not? Where were the men? Why was the only one willing to haul a millstone up a high tower, a woman, willing to lean out the window of a tower, a woman, and crush the head of the tyrant? Well, so the Latin phrase goes, sic semper tyrannis. What does it mean? It means thus always to tyrants. Can I get an amen? There's something curious in this play. Not the first time in Judges we've seen this. Deliverance at the hand of a woman who crushes the head of an adversary. This is not unintentional. This is an intentional ploy to bring out this meta, proto, gospel theme, the seed planted in Genesis 3, that the head of the serpent shall be crushed by the seed of the woman. Now, I'm not saying this story has no historicity. This is absolutely true, reported as fact, and as verifiable as any other story of history. But I'm saying as God weaves his meta-narrative of redemption, we're seeing themes emerge. Now, what are the four questions that Pastor Tom has offered as an interpretive framework of this study? What happened in the actual story? Well, we've traced that fairly carefully tonight. Secondly, how does this story push forward the story of redemptive history in the Bible? Particularly, I think you're supposed to meditate upon the undue demise of Abimelech, who's pretty heroic in battle, is pretty treacherous in covenant. It is entire undoing is a no-name, innocent, fairly unspoken for young woman. This is meant to lead you into anticipation. Imagine you'd never read your Bible before. Imagine you'd never read the story of redemption and understood the way that the meta-narrative unfolds. Imagine you're following this, tracing it chronologically, and these themes keep arising. You would get to a point in redemptive history where you would anticipate God is going to bring redemption through an unlikely young woman. And of course, as the story unfolds, you know. Young Virgin Mary of Nazareth. An unknown town, a barely reputable village. The town was probably the size of a small parking lot. Had maybe a few dozen people living there. Didn't have enough water to supply a large population base. Can anything good come from Nazareth was at least its broad reputation at the time of Christ. In each of these stories is demonstrating. Redemptive history is unfolding perfectly as God would prophesy in Genesis 3. Now, more explicitly, how does this story point to Christ? How does this story foreshadow or demonstrate or put forth Jesus? We know that this is an impetus of Old Testament interpretation. We get this from Jesus himself in Luke chapter 24 when he walks the road to Emmaus with two of his unwitting disciples and he unfolds all of the Old Testament showing how it points to Messiah and establishes the glorious reign of redemption. This is one of those stories where It's a fairly challenging connection to make. In fact, there's zero overt connection. What we see in a story like this is the power of anti-type. It's nothing more than the function of black velvet to display radiant diamond. There's a king. There's a king who brings a curse upon his people. He does nothing but have bloodshed of his people. He ultimately brings destruction on the city itself, burns it to the ground, salts the earth, and leaves it infertile and unlivable for the indefinite future. It's nothing quite like an antitype. To then leave you at the end of this story, as I'd already said, you you have a sense of of, of resentment and despondency, maybe even partially you think, I could have just as easily skipped that chapter, and I don't think I would have lost much, except one thing, friend, and that's the thing I want to draw your attention to. This chapter leaves you longing for heaven's king. It leaves you longing for a righteous king. 
that loves his people, confers grace upon his people, is merciful toward his people. He encourages the the well-being and the uplifting and the fertility of his people. And above all, when his people sin, he bears their reproach. That friend is nothing short of the gospel story. That God sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to live sin-free where we abjectly fail. No one here tonight, I presume, is going to declare their perfect righteousness. I hope none of us lack that level of self-awareness. We are sinners through and through. We are morally bankrupt. We are depraved and heaven has sent a king, not Abimelech. Can you say thank God for that? But Christ the Lord, who comes into this world, and bears our reproach in his body on the cross. I, when I look at stories like this, I am so sinful, shock, horror, surprise, maybe none of you, I am so sinful, I never read myself in the Abimelechs. But I am Abimelech. I am rotten to the core. Not because I'm the worst person you met, some of you, maybe haven't met enough people, probably, right? but at least because I know that in and of myself dwells no good thing. I know this. I know that even my best intentions and my best actions and my most moral uprightness is fueled by a sense of self-aggrandizing. I know this. I know this. And I'm so glad that the mercy and grace of God can come into this world in human form, the form of Christ, can redeem not only an Abimelech, but can redeem a sinner as wicked as me. It is a story of redemption, but only by the antitype, only by by being the black velvet as the backdrop to the glistening diamond of redemption. There is a king who not only brings no curse upon his people, he has no sins to bequeath upon them, but he's able to the uttermost to take their sin, atone for them, and bring redemption and everlasting life. I present to you Christ Jesus, the Lord. How should we then live? The final question. We'll close with this. If we've received Christ by faith, if we are the beneficiaries of this wonderful redemption, that his sin-free life, His vicarious atoning death, His triumphant resurrection have wonderfully wrought for those who believe. That's you. And this chapter has tremendous implications for how you live. If that's not you, if if you're here tonight and you've not yet trusted in Christ, I'm not trying to encourage you to a higher level of morality. I'm not trying to stir you up to just be a better guy. Wake up tomorrow, a better person than you went to bed tonight. That's not the message. The message is flee to Christ. Flee to Christ. But if you have, if you trusted Christ, then I present, as I said, this chapter has tremendous benefit. I want you to see this connection tonight that the sins of Abimelech are first observed and seen and noticed in the life of Gideon. Like father, like son. I want us to understand this connection. So the next time you are tempted to sin, and friend, trust me, before you leave this building, you may have one of those moments. Before you go to bed tonight, you may have one of those moments. Before you finish this week, you will have temptations to sin. Don't check out at this point and say, well, he's talking to the sinners in the room, I'm exempt. Every one of us, next time you are tempted to sin, I want you to have one thought in your mind. When you indulge, And where you indulge, your children will lavishly exploit. Where you sow seeds in your life of sinfulness, lust, rebellion, your children will reap a harvest of unrighteousness. Where was Gideon to raise in discipline and admonition of the Lord his son Abimelech? Where was Gideon playing the high life? Being the player, courting the women, having as many children as he wanted to, indulging indulging this lasciviousness and idolatry. Gideon, the hero, you've heard it said, this is the thing with the book of Judges, even the heroes, you're repulsed by them. And so you should be. I want you to think this thought, next time you are tempted to sin. So David the adulterer, to Solomon the womanizer. So Jacob the deceiver, to his sons, the liars. 
and unfaithful. In fact, there are too many examples in Scripture to provide at this time, except to say this, the sins of the fathers are visited on the children and the children's children. So next time you're staring at that computer screen with the indulgence to click and enjoy, ask yourself, am I content that this small dose of sin will become a lifelong addiction for my children? Ask yourself. Don't read the story of Abimelech and think that all your frustration should be directed at Abimelech. Read Abimelech's story and say, his father's sins are exaggerated in the manifestation of the son. And this is a repeated pattern, not just in Scripture, but in everyday life. Whatever are those weaknesses, particularly of fathers, but certainly also of mothers, I speak to fathers because I, I am one. But as we think about our, our, our parenting, our, our discipling of our children, and maybe we don't have children, maybe we're too young, or maybe that's just not been the path of life that God has chosen for us, but wherever we exert influence, you cannot underestimate the effect of the indulgences that you allow in your life to manifest without bridle in the lives of your children. Next time you're tempted to sin, ask, am I okay with my children being plagued their entire life with even just the small little sins that I allow? Fathers in particular, let me close by saying this, and I want this to, I want this to land hard. I want this to hit home. The greatest gift, fathers, that you can ever give your sons and daughters is your devotion to Christ and your dedication to kill sin. It's the greatest gift you can give them. There is an imperceptible transference of that which is a weakness of temptation in you to being a full-blown cancer in your children as far as unrighteousness. This is the story of Judges chapter 9. You're meant to read chapter 8 and you're meant to feel this, this, this glorious heroism of Gideon and you're meant to really become a fan and say, this guy's amazing. He's, he's doubting, he's, he's cowardly, he's unbelieving and, and he's so blessed and anointed by God and he's crushing the Midianites and you get to the end of the story. And at the end of the story, he's given over of his life. Much like Solomon. Much like many others in Scripture. They start well, but they end poorly. And the lives of the next generation are nothing but the overindulgence of those sins that were allowed in the first generation. We take this to the Lord. We ask Him for grace. Knowing none of us are sin free. None of us are perfect. We all stand in need of grace. Then may I close with these words of the great Puritan John Owen. You must be killing sin or sin is killing you. No neutrality. No middle ground. No peace talks. Never. It is outright war. Declare war on your sin. Pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity we've had tonight to gather around your word, to study these scriptures. And thereby, Lord God, I ask that you grant your spirit's empowerment that we would be so challenged. For those of us here that don't even know Jesus in a saving way, maybe we know about Jesus, we might know the story, we might know the facts. For those of us that are here that don't know Jesus in a personal, redemptive way, may we right now, where we sit, trust in Christ. Delay no further moment, put no other hindrance, but to know right now, if we receive Christ in our hearts, by faith, all our sins are forgiven and eternal life is granted. May we know that. Father God, for those of us, well, we've received Jesus. Lord God, we, we, we are saved. We, we are believers. I pray, Lord God, I beg, I plead with you. Give us that sin-killing power that we need. H help us to be reminded tonight that when we indulge, we bring great contaminant into our life and those are the lives we're called to serve as leaders, as pastors, as fathers, and in any and all spheres of influence. Lord God, by your grace, empower us to be killing sin, knowing that there is no neutrality. We ask, Lord God, your blessing upon all these things. May Christ be exalted in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.